So just to introduce quickly the, uh, the webinar, so different parts of the presentation, we'll go through different subjects. So let's have an overview of this subject, which is complicated and, and rich. So first we will talk about the hurt of the malolactic fermentation. So what are the mechanisms? How does it work? Uh, why is it interesting for bacteria to, um, to do this malolactic, malolactic fermentation? And then we'll see as well, what are the conditions that impacts the malolactic fermentation kinetics? And what is uh, the interest of, uh, of mastering these conditions to make sure the fermentation is going well? Then why do we use a selected strain instead of a spontaneous bacteria? We will have a look at, uh, in terms of quality, in terms of, um, of, uh, of purpose of the use, uh, what we have in terms of bacteria. And finally as well, the Lamontadier selection process for bacteria. Uh, when we talk about selected strain, what do we mean uh, when we say selected? What is behind uh, the, the, the process of selecting a bacteria? And to conclude as well, when and how to, to add malolactic bacteria, if it's for inoculation, sequential, restart malolactic fermentation as well. So a when and how uh, words about this, uh, this uh, aspect. So just to be back at the, at the beginning of the malolactic fermentation mechanisms, it's all rely on the proton flow. So what do we mean by a proton flow is that there is an exchange of protons, so H plus, that goes in and goes out of the cell. And this proton flow produce ATP and helps the bacteria as well to, to consume ATP. So basically, if you produce and consume ATP at the same time, the balance is zero. So the bacteria cannot develop itself, cannot increase in terms of population and cannot start a good mechanisms of malolactic fermentation. That's why the bacteria actually performs malolactic to survive and to grow. And it's all relied on the enzymatic conversion of L-lactic to L-lactic acid. So it starts with two steps. First, there is a growth of the bacterial population. So they use a little bit of reducing sugars. You don't even see it on the analytics most of the time but they use a little bit of sugars and then they use the consumption of amino acids. So the, basically the rest of the, um, the yeast during fermentation or the kind of amino acid that you can add to, uh, to feed the bacteria. And then it will start the malolactic metabolisms, which is the proper metabolisms of the malolactic, which creates ATP using another proton flow. And this proton flow is actually the transformation of L-malic acid into lactate, which is a, a form of lactic acid. And there is also an exit of two protons. And this exit combined with the lactate helps to create ATP for the bacteria. So the balance is positive and the bacteria is producing energy when she does the, the malactic fermentation. So for the wine, uh, it does change things as well because there is an increase of the microbial stability because the malic acid is not very stable when the lactic acid is very stable. It participates as well to the wine organolytic profile because you, you soften the wine and you, uh, you reduce the acidity. So you balance a bit the profile and you help as well for the fruit because most of the bacteria, they're producing esters. And then you balance the acidity. Uh, basically, we, we, we admit that one gram of L-malic acid, which is consumed, leads to a decrease of 0.4 gram per liter of total acidity. So you reduce the total acidity and you help to balance the profile. The impacting factors, they are very, uh, very numerous, but most, uh, most of them and the most important of them will be the pH, the amount of SO2 you have in the wine, the content of ethanol and the temperature as well. So there is very precise conditions where these factors are very much impacting the malolactic fermentation. And then let's say a second class factors we have the content of low malic acid. We have the microbial competition. If the wine is already uh, full with another bacteria or yeast or whatever, it can have a microbial competition between bacteria and yeast. And then there is a need of alcoholic fermentation as well, because an alcoholic fermentation that doesn't go well leads to the production of inhibitor fatty acids. And these fatty acids, we'll see that in the second part of the presentation, they are not good for the malolactic fermentation and they act actually inhibit the, the kinetics of the bacteria. And then you have also the pesticide residues that can be a problem and the phenolic content. 
So to, to illustrate this, uh, we used to say that the pH is a key thing because it does influence the other parameters. So temperature will be optimal at 20 degrees uh, Celsius. Alcohol is more or less limiting depending on the level of SO2 and the temperature. And the level of SO2 as well is a, is a problem because low pH increase SO2, so the molecular SO2. So basically low pH increase the impact of the SO2. So for example, if I take a pH 3, the alcohol rate will be more limiting than if the pH will be 3.4. So it, it is this combination of different factors that gives a level of fermentability of the wine. And we, we have an idea of if it is going to be complicated or if it's going to be easy to ferment the wine. So this is why we need to, to think about how we can use the, the malactic bacteria. Uh, if I use a safe state train or if I take the risk of the spontaneous malactic fermentation, because you can use a spontaneous flora, which is indigenous from the wine, but it can have risk of contamination. You don't have any control on the aromatic profile as well. So if it does volatile, then you will have volatile in your wine. There is no, uh, no exit for this. And then it can have as well a slow, uh, very slow kinetics. It can take time before it starts. And this is an open door for Brettanomyces to get into wine and to have a spoilage. Same thing with the cross seeding. If you have a good strain at the beginning, cross seeding is interesting, but after one or two cuts, then you lose the initial strain because there is another uh, strain that are increasing and so on. So you, you start to, to create microbial complication and that's where you have risks of contamination and as well slow to start uh, and complete malactic fermentation. Then you have buildup cultures and direct inoculation uh, this is the case when you use selected strain. It is very interesting to use direct inoculation because you reduce the cost and the labor. And you avoid, of course, by answering uh, a good fermentation, a safe fermentation, you avoid any spoilage in terms of aromatic. So uh, this kind of aromas of a mouse and so on. So at Lamotani, we select the strain through uh, a very specific uh, process. First, we have a list of criterions that we need to expect. In first place, we look for robustness in given difficult con conditions. So we, we analyze the market and say, okay, there is a need for this kind of bacteria. So we have a specific use. That's why we produce and we, we propose different bacteria as well in the range. So there's one bacteria, one specific use. Most of the time, we want it to be um, an improvement for the the aromatic profile and uh, new characteristics as well. Most important above all will be the fermentation safety. So population, physiological state and um, viability of the population. And then of course, uh, the bacteria has to improve quality and improve the production. So the strain we get exclusively from nature. Uh, they are isolated from, uh, from grape must, wine and winery environment and the project collaboration with university and research center. So we, we, we share this experience and we make sure we have all together a good work for the selection. And we base our work on external culture collections. So it can be up to a thousand individuals. Uh, among them, we will try to find the one we need. So then we process it during, uh, through different steps. First will be the collection of candidate bacteria. So most of them will be unoccupation strain. And then we do first a genetic screening uh, where we look at redhibitory genes and microsatellites. Microsatellites, to make it very easy, it is a sequence of very small bases that are repeated in the DNA. So TC, 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 or AATP, etc. And these microsatellites, they are very specific to one individual. So if you have a collection of a thousand different bacteria, then if you have two, two profiles of microsatellites that are very, very similar, you can conclude that these strains, they are likely to be the same. So we remove one and we keep the other one. Then we go ahead with the selection with the isolation of interesting strain. We do micro vinification trials to have a look at the kinetics, at the, the flavor, at the production of volatile, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, when we think we have found the good one, we go ahead and we do trials, real conditions with wineries, with partners uh, in our experimental center and so on. And then we end up with one bacteria that, we, uh, that we, we wanted to have and that we selected. 
The example, for example, for uh, the NO1, NO1, which is uh, one of the most known bacteria for La Montabier, we selected in we selected the NO1 in 2012, in 2012 through the works of Marion Favier, which is part of the R&D department of, uh, of Montabier. And we, we based all the, the research among different criterions, so production, uh, ability to survive, the latency, latency has to be short, the active malolactic fermentation, so the time during malolactic fermentation is, uh, is run, and then the total malolactic fermentation time, which is the latency uh, additional with the active malolactic fermentation. If we take the example of the one in the in the circle, the bacteria would be potentially good because the, 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 the squares are likely to be gray or white. But the thing is, it has a purple square on the production. That means even if the strain looks good, it would be impossible to produce industrially this strain because of the requirement it has. So this is also a big part of the, the, the process and the selection. Then we have a quality control. Of course, we look for uh, different points. First, it's going to be the biogenic animals. The quality control points, first, it has to be the microbial population, has to be beyond the limit set by the codex, uh, which is just the regulation uh, that we have to protect. And then the absence of Sainamelesterase activity, is, it's also checked for our strain. The validation of the absence of biogenic amine production is very important because if the bacteria produce histamine, histamine Based on um, histamine, based on histamine, uh, through an enzymatic pathway, it can lead to allergies, uh, allergic reactions, and headaches for the customer. On the other hand, if the, the bacteria produces putrescine, which is another of putrefaction, then we have a very bad smell, and it is very uh, dramatic for the aromatic profile. And these compounds, they, are, they have a very small perception threshold, which is close to 60 milligrams per liter. And then, for the bacteria in our range, uh, they don't have this because we make sure they don't have this pathway in terms of enzymatic, because we, we, can, uh, we can have a look at it and we can see it with the genetic uh, approach. Another point in the cinnamidesterase activity, so to make it easy, cinnamidesterase activity by itself is not a problem. The problem is that it creates a reaction uh, if you have any further spoilage of the wine. So, it all starts with esters of cyanic acid, so caftaric and cutaric. And if the bacteria or even the yeast is cyanamidesterase positive, then it will transform these esters of cyanic acids into cyanic acids, so caffeic, cumaric, and ferulic. Most important is cumaric and ferulic. And then when you have an activity of the yeast or betanomyces, if this one, they are able to produce cinnamate decarboxylase, they will transform the cyanic acids into vinyl phenol or vinyl gaiacol. And later on, if you have betanomyces with the vinyl phenol reductase activity, that's where you have ethyl phenol and ethyl gaiacol. So it's important to use bacteria without this cinematesterase activity to make sure you don't start this, uh, this reaction and you don't start the production in, uh, of uh, vinyl phenol. So how do we have a look at it? It's very easy. We take a, a red wine after alcoholic fermentation. We do the malolactic. Uh, here it was this L1 and Xtreme. Uh, and then after malolactic fermentation, we do the analysis of cumaric and ferulic acids. So in this case, there was no cumaric and no ferulic acids found in the wine. Uh, it can be either because the bacteria is cinnamidesterase negative or it's because there is no precursors. So to check the presence of precursors, we take the same red wine, we do the treatment with a non-FC enzyme that we know, and then we do the analysis of the wine two weeks after the addition of the enzyme. And in this case, you can see that we have a presence and we can detect cumaric and ferulic. So that means there was a substrate to produce um, free cinnamic esterase. So ono one and extreme, they are free cinnamic esterase because they don't transform the esters of cinnamic acids into cinnamic acids. So they don't initiate this reaction. And it is a safety for the, the profile and the, the winemaker. Another point as well, which is important and uh, uh, that we talk a lot, is about the diacetyl. So diacetyl management, very well connected to the malolactic bacteria, because you can find the origin of the compound uh, mostly during the malolactic fermentation due to the lactic bacteria. A little bit of the yeast, they produce a little bit of diacetyl, but most of it is produced uh, based on the citric acid that the lactic bacteria will transform into diacetyl. And in total absence of SO2, they will transform this diacetyl 
in acetoin, this acetoin in butanol, and then uh, the way back, so butanol to acetoin, acetoin to the acetyl, etc. So it's changed form. But most of the time, when you use sulfite, you stop the reaction and you have the diacetyl that you have. So it's important to know when the bacteria is going to produce the malactic, the, the diacetyl, and to stop it before it does. It. So it can be either at the end of the malactic fermentation or way after. So let's say one week or two weeks after malactic fermentation. If you leave the wine without SO2, then the bacteria will start to produce uh, the diacetyl. So if we took an example of, uh, of an O1, for example, this is the kinetics. So on the graph, you can see uh, there are three periods, alcoholic fermentation, malolactic fermentation, and the phase where we know the diacetyl production is done. So during alcoholic fermentation and malolactic, you can see that the malic acid is decreased. This is normal, we are doing malolactic fermentation. So the one is transforming the malic acid to lactic acid. And at the end of the, of the malolactic fermentation, that's where the start of the, um, the citric acid metabolism uh, is uh, appearing. So you can see that after my fermentation, the no one starts to eat the citric acid, and that will enter the diacetyl production. So looking for us, it is after malactic fermentation. So we use the sulfites at the end of the malactic, then we don't have don't have diacetyl. And for the co-inoculation as well, if you use bacteria and yeast in co-inoculation, you will end up with a wine with very poor concentrations of the acetyl because the yeast is going to eat what bacteria is producing. So this is a, a good partnership they make because one is eating um, shit from the other. So basically, you keep a wine uh, free of the acetyl almost. Then the combining compounds, very important as well to improve the SO2 efficiency. The combining compound is produced by the yeast during alcoholic fermentation, and, um, and they are consumed then by the bacteria. So the ethanol, uh, but also pyrolic acid, oxoglutaric, uh, the three of them, they are produced by the yeast. Basically, it doesn't have impact on the wine, you don't smell it, but the thing is they combine very quickly with the SO2. So at the end of the alcoholic fermentation, if you want to stabilize your wine and put SO2 on the wine, you will actually combine it and you will have to add more SO2 to make sure you don't have any uh, problem of stability. But if you do a lactic fermentation, you will naturally eat this ethanol and other compounds. And so you will reduce the amount of combining compounds that you have in the wine. So we, you will end up with a wine which is more ready to accept SO2 and you will put a little bit less of SO2 uh, if your wine is free of um, combining compounds. You can see it on the graph uh, on the right. Uh, after alcoholic fermentation, you have a TL35, which is actually the amount of SO2 you need to add to the, to the, the wine to reach 35 or free SO2. So if you take an example of end of alcoholic fermentation, you are about uh, around 675. But if you wait after malactic fermentation, you, get, you go down to 60 milligrams per liter. So that means the difference is due to less combination of the SO2. So you improve uh, the SO2 efficiency, you will put less, you have the same level of protection. Then you've been in the, you, you've been seeing in the, in the previous slide that we talked about the extreme, and the one, et cetera. Each of them, they have specific condition and they have specific use. So if we first talk about the bacteria extreme, it is a bacteria we wanted for specific acid conditions. So this is an example of a trial we made uh, in 2021 on Albarino in, um, in the region of uh, Galice, so it's uh, northeast of Spain, northwest of Spain, on Albarino. So alcohol rate was around 13, uh, with a low VA, a little bit of residual sugar, but it was wanted by the winemaker. They want to keep a little bit of sugars because acidity is very high. So pH was uh, 3.16 and total acidity was close to nine. Temperature was set at 20 degrees and malolactic fermentation index, which is a, a number that depends of uh, the pH temperature, alcohol, and so on. So all the factors I was talking at the beginning, we combine them stati statistically and we get the malolactic fermentation index, uh, which is a, a mark uh, on 20. So here nine out of 20 is a bad mark. So basically the malolactic fermentation should be complicated on this point based on the analytics. So we did 
two modalities. First, the bacteria extreme uh, with a direct inoculation. So uh, basically, we just put the bacteria into a bit of water to dilute, to dilute it, and then we add to the wine versus a control, uh, which was uh, rehydrated for 12 hours and then added to the wine. So you can see bacteria extreme in less than 20 days did the malactic fermentation in total with almost four grams per liter of malic acid. And it did it quicker than the control, which was a bacteria that acclimatated. So basically here you, did, you see the difference of the, the power and the, the abilities of the bacteria to do a quick malactic fermentation with a very easy use. So is inoculation direct. When we talk about um, an easy use or a very efficient uh, use of the bacteria, then we can uh, we can talk about Pono one as well because it's very suitable for co-inoculation and sequential. So Pono one is one of the, the, the bacteria we have that hold uh, very well the, the alcohol. You can see it in, the, in this trial. It was three different wines: so wine A, B, and C all fermented with different yeast. So basically that's why you have a difference of the malic acid in the content. And each of them has been inoculated with ono one to run the malactic fermentation. And then the control of course was not inoculated, so it didn't start in malactic. So the trials uh, all inoculated with ono one they started malactic fermentation less than a week after inoculation. The malactic was clean and fast, it lasted less than eight days. So the wines were ready earlier for rotation, blending, and stabilization. When you look at the control A, malactic, you can see after seven days, uh, it starts slowly, so spontaneously. Then for the control B and C that I didn't put on the graph, malactic didn't even start after 15 days. So you see here the importance of having a quick inoculation and a quick start, because within these 15, 20 days, if nothing happens, your one is not protected with SO2, so basically, you can have an open door for spoilage with Brettanomyces and other um, spoilage yeast. So it is a risk you take if you keep this one unprotected and free of inoculated population. So this was sequential, but also the co-inoculation is a very well and very interesting process to, to work with because it offers basically many benefits. If you take the example of the, the guys that are bicycling uh, on, on the screen, it's very, very illustrating the, um, the, the way that bacteria and yeast are working. Because the goal is to run the malactic fermentation at the same time as alcoholic fermentation. So we use a selected wine bacteria and a selected yeast as well. We know they match together. So we add the bacteria and shortly after, like 24, 48 hours, we add the yeast and we run the two fermentations at the same time. So why should I do co-inoculation? What, what's the purpose of it? What's the goal? First, it's going to be the secure the malolactic, malolactic fermentation to make sure you won't have any issue with malolactic because you have less inhibitors, less impact of medium chain fatty acid. We'll talk about it uh, in a few slides. You have natural warm temperatures as well because the yeast by the fermentation increase the temperature, so it creates good conditions for the bacteria. So the nutrients is good, condition is good because there is low alcohol. At this point, we don't have 14, 15% alcohol. So all the conditions are good. It is a perfect world for bacteria to run the malactic fermentation. As well, because you have no microbial vacuum between um, IF and MLF, you have a limited risk of spoilage as well. And then you have an organoleptic profile you have less oxidation, less diacetyl, because the yeast is going to eat what the bacteria is producing. And you have an increase of esters, acetates, and finally fresher wines with a better balance. This is for analytics and analogy, but at the same time, you save time and you save work as well. So it's less labor for you, and it is a cost-effective way to, uh, to work with more lactic fermentation. So what we recommend at La Matabier would be the yeast and bacteria best compatibility. And what we uh, we have in the range would be the Excellence XR and the Uno one. We've been working with co-inoculation since almost 15 years now. Uh, so we have very good feedback on these couples of XR and Uno one. And they are very well made uh, one to each other. Of course, later you will add 
uh, less SO2 because you need the bacteria to work uh, and you need as well to control the fermentation temperature. So basically under 86 uh, Fahrenheit degrees. Just a quick example of a trial with co inoculation. So it was done in 2020 uh, with our partner, with our local partner in Australia. So it was based in Kuwara, in Kuwara. And it was a trial with two different modalities. So two different trials, same wine. One was inoculated with the couple Excellence XR101, and the other one was with the yeast A and uh, bacteria A. That's the way we're going to call them in this case of the, of the trial. And you can see that Excellence XR did a very clean and short alcoholic fermentation. So in like nine, 10 days, the wine was dry. And if you look at the purple curve, which is in dots, the NO1 malic acid kinetics, you can see that as soon as the Excellence XR starts the alcoholic fermentation, NO1 starts as well the malolactic fermentation. So here you have 10 days alcoholic fermentation and you have about 20 days malolactic fermentation, but there is no vacuum between the end of the alcoholic fermentation and the malolactic fermentation, because when alcoholic fermentation finishes, the malolactic fermentation is already on the way and it just finishes a few days later. When you take the other modality, yeast A and bacteria A, you can see that the malolactic fermentation of this trial started at the end of the alcoholic fermentation. So here you can have a spoilage and you can have a problem and you can have finally a need to warm up the tank and to, to help this malolactic fermentation. So for the first couple, XR and N1, alcoholic fermentation and malolactic fermentation was the fastest and the cleanest kinetics. And then for the alternative couple, it was a bit more complicated. So in the first case, the wine was ready sooner, ready to be stabilized, ready to be bottled, and so on. In terms of uh, cost effectiveness, uh, this is the study we did in 2010. So from 2010 to 2014, it was run for, three, for four years. You can see the cost per liter when we, we take account of the electricity, cost of the no one, cost of analysis as well to, to follow the malolactic fermentation. We also introduced the barrel management cost. We end up with a total cost of the malolactic fermentation. So in the year one, 27% of the production was inoculated through co-inoculation. So basically the global cost of malolactic fermentation at this time was 4.8 euro per hectoliter, so close to $5, 5.2, And as long as you go ahead with a bigger production of uh, co-inoculation, so year two was 49%, year three was 73%, year four, they, they did the whole production, so uh, close to 5,000 hectoliters in co-inoculation, you can see that the global cost of malolactic fermentation went from five euros per hectoliter to 1.7 euro per hectoliter. And the most, um, uh, the most uh, economy you do on, the, on money is on electricity because you, you, you go from 19,000 euros to 0,000 euros. And the one, of course, the cost increased because you buy more bacteria to, to, um, to inoculate. But the cost of analysis goes down. You just do a malic, a malic check at the end just to, to see if malolactic fermentation is done. And you don't have any cost uh, connected to the barrel management as well, because you don't have to warm up, to move it, to rack, and so on. So the total cost for the winery with co inoculation went from 26,000 euros to 9,000 euros just by switching to co inoculation. And we don't take account here of the time as well for the, uh, the workers and the people that works in the winery to move it, to rack it, to check, to get the samples, to go to the lab, and so on. So it is very long time, it is, uh, it is long to do, and it represents hours of work that also has a cost for the, for the company. So year four was definitely the most uh, interesting in terms of economy with the NOI. So just to conclude and to go on with uh, the, the part with nutrition and uh, management, the organization of co-inoculation is very interesting because you have a better visibility of the lot, so better rotation, better anticipation. You can improve the cellar management. So if you if you save time uh, to the barrel management, then you can uh, you can do something else at the same time. So it's it's, uh, it's time, uh, time effective. You have an early stabilization, uh, so you can blend earlier. You can you can start the aging earlier. You can release in the market earlier as well. So it is always interesting to uh, to have this in mind. 
the wine quality you will reduce the risks of microbial contamination and you reduce as well the oxidation because you don't leave the wine unprotected for uh, an amount of days that depends of the malolactic. In terms of business, uh, you can start wine tasting earlier as well. You can commercialize the wines sooner as well. You can release them on the market. And finally, in terms of cost efficiency, you reduce the labor, the barrel management, the analysis cost, and the energetic costs as well. So basically, there's most of, uh, most of it is very interesting to, to switch and to, to use bacteria in co-inoculation. But co-inoculation or not, the bacteria, they have needs for, uh, for the malactic fermentation. So these needs, they are very well connected to the nutrition uh, because the bacteria only feeds with amino acids and they can't use mineral forms of nitrogen. They have specific uh, proteolytic and peptidolytic activities, uh, which is enzymes from the, the membrane. Uh, basically, they use autolysis residues from the yeast, and they can, uh, with this enzyme that are the, the chainsaw on the, on the power point, they will use it to hydrolyze the proteins that are in the mass. So the proteins into amino acids, and then these amino acids will be transformed into peptides uh, through the peptidolytic activities, and then there will be amines. Then the bacteria is going to eat it and use it for its consumption. As well, you need to, uh, to have an eye on the inhibitors. We talked about it earlier in the presentation. We have short and medium chain fatty acids, so C4 and C10, basically, that are produced by the yeast when they enter a stress conditions. Stress conditions can be cold, can be too much SO2, can be um, an excess of, uh, uh, um, let's say, a, a too poor concentration of oxygen. So they start to stress and they produce these uh, medium chain fatty acids. And these medium chain fatty acids, they are not good because they interfere with the bacterial activity and its metabolism. They actually get to the bacteria, they stick to the membrane and they reduce the membrane fluidity. But because they are charged as well, they have a, they have a positive or negative charge. They go through the membrane and they release a proton in the medium of the bacteria. So they change the intracellular pH of the bacteria, which is normally around six. pH in one will be around 3.6, let's say, on, on reds. So by increasing the amount of protons in the bacteria, you actually lower the intracellular pH of the bacteria. So to keep it good, the bacteria has to exit the, the H+, plus, these protons, and it costs energy for her. So basically, when she does this, she loses energy fighting with the medium chain fatty acids. And it can go very high. If you look at the analysis on the right, it is a wine from 2020. It was a, a, stop, a stopped wine. So we did the analysis, and we could see that the, the amount of, uh, of medium chain fatty acid were close to 23 milligrams per liter, which is a lot, and which is enough to stop any kind of molecular fermentation. So with this in the medium, there will be no start of the malolactic fermentation because it is too much for the bacteria to fight with. So what we do recommend uh, when you have a, like a, a stuck wine or a fermentation that didn't go well, to make sure you will have a good start of malolactic bacteria, do recommend the addition of optifluoro. Optifluoro, which is uh, very interesting because you have yeast derivatives and you have yeast hosts as well in it. So yeast derivative, they will act like a nutrient substrate. So they will give um, amino acids to the bacteria. So basically it increases the bac bacteria development and the yeast holes, you can use it to fix the medium fat chain fatty acids, so inhibitors fatty acids, and they work as detox detoxification. You can see on the right, the effect of uh, an addition of ML nutrients during the malactic fermentation for the bacteria. You can see that even if the bacteria inoculation uh, is good and the population was good, which is the blue curve. You have uh, about 1 million bacteria per milliliter at this time, day five. Day 21, still the population didn't move, didn't increase, and the malolactic fermentation, which is the, the purple curve, didn't start. That means the bacteria is, is in the wine. She's like, okay, uh, there is food, but there is uh, inhibitor fatty acid, so no malolactic fermentation, ignition at this point. As soon as you add the, the nutrition, amino acids, little bit of histols, then you have an increase of the population. So the population goes to 1 million 
to 100 million uh, bacteria per, per milliliter. And a few days later, you have a drop of malic acid. That means malactic fermentation has started. So that's why sometimes we inoculated the bacteria. We wait like four or five days, 10 days, and we say, oh, I think the bacteria is not working. Most of the time, the bacteria, if you check it, it is still in the wine. It is just unable to start because she's fighting with other compounds. Maybe it's too cold. Maybe there are inhibitor fatty acids. Maybe there is a little bit too much of SO2. But most of the time, you can solve the problem just by a check and an addition of nutrition, specifically and, and more especially when you have difficult conditions. Optifluor O as well is very interesting because it helps to, to reduce pesticides. It is very sticky uh, yeast derivative. So you reduce the, the amount of inhibitor fatty acids and you reduce as well the pesticide residues that you can have in the wine. But most of the time, it's not very much because it's already um, <clears throat> got by the yeast and they reduce the amount total of these pesticides. So then to, to try to conclude, we also have a word about stuck fermentation and troubleshooting. Basically, when you, when you do a diagnosis of the fermentation arrest, um, you, you have a problem with the fermentation completion. So you, you need to have a check of the microbial situation chemical composition, and also the other inhibiting factors. You need, you need to react because the wine is stuck, there is still sugar. So the, the best thing you can do is to add a bit of SO2. Like we talk about 1.5, 2, 2.5 gram per, per hectoliter maximum. Not, to, not to, to protect the wine, not to stabilize it, but just to kill the few yeast or the few bacteria that started to ferment or that stopped fermenting. You have to know that a yeast that stopped the fermentation is very in a bad shape. So if you add a little bit of SO2, you just kill it and you make a wine clearer and, and more, uh, more stable in terms of microbial. You, 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 you need to add as well yeast pulse um, and then you rack it. Uh, best recommendation we can have is to leave this, this, uh, this pulse about 24 hours uh, to make sure it will settle, stick with inhibitor fatty acids. And then you can start the malactic fermentation after racking. Or you can re-inoculate the wine if, uh, if you need to restart the fermentation. Then if you need, you can treat or adjust as well different wine parameters. If you see the pH is very low, like 2.8, 2.9, uh, then you can desacidify a little bit to increase this pH and creates more easy conditions for the bacteria. As well, uh, we, we, don't, we can't do it in France, but uh, I think in, in USA you can. So you can adjust as well the alcohol uh, if this one is very high. You can, you can reduce it by, by a liter. You can also add Actibiol, which is a dedicated solution for malactic fermentation. It is rich in amino acids and uh, yeast rules, so detoxifying uh, agent, which is going to absorb the toxin. You can use as well uh, Kibret to make sure you eliminate any spoilage microbes, so about four grams per hectoliter. It is a prevention uh, act if, if it would be a very uh, treating doses, you would be a bit higher. And then you, you let it settle for, for a few hours, like 24, 48, and then you rack off the leads. And then you have a very clear wine, easy to work, and then that you can go on with the malactic bacteria. You need to add the nutrients as soon as you add the bacteria. You, you don't have to wait uh, to, uh, to add it. You can use it at the same time you add the bacteria, so they will benefit from it uh, from the beginning. So 10 gram per liter of Optifloco. And then you add directly to the wine, under one or bacteria extreme, one gram per hectoliter, depending of the condition you have. If it's a low pH, would rather go for bacteria extreme. And if the, the alcohol content is quite high, then you will go for another one. Then you will keep temperature around 65, 75 Fahrenheit degrees to make sure you have a, a proper conditions for the malactic bacteria. So, Thank you, everyone, for your attention. I hope it was clear. There was a lot of information. Uh, I put here the contacts of, of Eglantine, Laura Goulvan as well, which is the um, market manager for Bouchavala in, uh, in Sonoma and Napa, and my contact if any time you have a, a problem or a need. And any contacts, you would be uh, happy to, to share. Mm -hmm.